In this video, we're going to look at some alternative compression types, and we're not going to spend a ton of time on them. Some of these are going to be more creative tools that you can use and revisit on a rainy day. But since we're talking about compression, there's certainly noteworthy mentions for this series. So these first couple of alternative compression types we're actually going to be using a little bit in some future videos. But the first one is called limiting, and you may have heard that term before, especially when we talk about the mastering industry. Now, most of the compressors that we've been using today are technically compressors slash limiters. You'll also hear the term limiting amplifier used, such as our Universal Audio 1176 and the Teletronics LA-2A. But a few other noteworthy mentions are the TubeTech CL1B, our Manly Variable Mu, our Neve 2264A, and even our SSL bus compressor. The technical definition of a limiter is any compressor with a ratio higher than 10 to 1. But more of the purpose-driven limiters have faster attack times and slower release times. You'll certainly see them in the mastering realm, but occasionally you'll see them when mixing and tracking. They're essentially there to prevent overs and clipping, but you can certainly use them as an effect as well. So it's basically a very, very heavy compression that doesn't really let much signal get past the limit of the threshold. In this particular session, I'm actually using a brick wall limiter after my master fader, just to make sure that there's no digital overs when I'm mixing down. Now, just to show you this, I've brought down my volume quite a bit here because I'm actually going to boost the gain up just so you can see how much you can get away with a brick wall limiter. So basically, I'm just gonna go ahead and increase our gain here and then just keep an eye on our peak meter here with the red fader. So we're at minus 0.4 dB on our master channel here, and we're at minus 0.4 dB on our brick wall limiter. We're pushing it pretty hard and nothing is getting passed. So limiters are actually some pretty powerful tools. And we'll revisit limiters more in depth when we start talking about compression in mastering. The next compressor type that we're going to look at is called a multiband compressor. Multiband compression is really a regular thing that you'll hear in the audio mastering industry, but you hear it a little bit less frequently when mixing. There are some really cool tricks you can pull off with a multiband compressor, but I usually look at them first as more of a corrective device. You'll typically see multiband compressors in the software world. Most modern DAWs already have multiband compressor plugins built in, but you can also certainly buy third-party multiband compressor plugins from manufacturers like Waves, Universal Audio, FabFilter, and Melda Production. There are a few hardware multiband compressors out there, but you don't really see them floating around every day in your typical commercial recording studio. They can be quite pricey, and you really don't use them as often as you would a single band compressor like the ones we've been using in this series. So normally, you'll see them more in higher-end mastering studios. So what exactly is multiband compression, and how does it work? The concept and layout of a multiband compressor is actually quite simple. I actually have a multiband compressor inserted here on my overhead drum track. The best way I can describe a multiband compressor is kind of like a marriage between an EQ and a compressor. The visual layout of a multiband compressor is very similar to what you see here. Essentially, we have the everyday compressors that we've been using all along, and each one of these compressors is assigned to a different frequency band. So we have lows, mids, high mids, and highs. Some multiband compressors have more bands and some have less bands. But basically, each one of these frequency bands has an adjustable crossover which we can define the limits of frequencies that these compressors are allowed to work with. And they give us a lot of flexibility, especially when trying to compress program material that has more energy in certain frequency bands than others. So say for instance, you end up with a mix that has a kick drum that's just a little over dynamic, but the rest of the mix is okay. You can actually solo out the lower frequency, zero in on the kick drum, and then set your compression settings. Now you can also use them as a de -er for vocals. By narrowing in on the frequency band where our S's are heavy, we can compress just those overly heavy areas. Now the benefit of using this multiband compressor as opposed to using the sidechain setup for a de -er is that the sidechained compressor is actually a full bandwidth compressor. So when we send our S's into the sidechain of the compressor, it's actually compressing the entire signal of that track and not just that certain frequency band. So you can certainly get a different kind of effect by using a multiband compressor as a de -esser. One of my favorite studio tricks that I learned when I was an intern was actually using a multiband compressor for overhead drum mics. Almost always when you get an overhead drum track, you always reach for that high pass filter to roll off the low end. 
Sometimes you'll throw on a de -esser just to tame some of the cymbals, or sometimes the snare is a little bit too dynamic in the overhead tracks. So by using a multiband compressor, we can accomplish all of those tasks in one pass. So basically what I'm going to do is first set my crossover points to where I think that they need to be set. And then we'll come in and start tweaking our compression settings. So we're going to try to adjust this first crossover point here. I like to set it right between the boxy part of the kick drum and the low pop of the snare drum. The high mid, I usually try to catch the snap of the snare drum. And the high band, I really try to zone in on that sizzly cymbal sound, right between the snare pop and the hi-hat. It'll usually tickle your ear a little bit when you put the crossover just in the right spot. So now we're going to set our compressors. I'm really going to try to accentuate the low pop of the snare drum. Open up the attack a little bit. Bring down the release. We just want some of that lower tone transient of the snare drum to pop through. And there it is. So moving on to the next band here, I'm really going to focus on the stick sound of the snare drum and the toms. I'm actually just trying to design that transient. This is really where some of the cymbals can get harsh too. So we can almost use this like a de -esser. Just always be mindful of your gain reduction meter, don't overdo it. Okay, now on to the high band. This band you really want to be careful of. You don't want to push these too hard. Again, we're just kind of trying to design that transient. Give it a little pop, even out those hi-hats. So now what I like to do is use the makeup gains of each compressor, kind of like an EQ. Take down our low band. That's going to be kind of like our high-pass filter. Just kind of push the highs a little bit. Bring down that harshness. So really, I just try to make it sound really super crispy with those cymbals and balance out the low end of the snare before and there's after so you probably could have gotten some similar results with an EQ a de -esser, and a compressor but for some things it's much easier just to do it in the multiband you can also use a multiband to even out the low end and pluck of a bass guitar to even out some of the pick and body sounds of an acoustic guitar you can take the honk sound out of a piano you can add some unique high-end breathy sounds to vocals. The list goes on. But just remember when we go back to our car analogy that there's compressors for everything. They're very purpose-driven applications. You're not going to use them for everything, so just be mindful when you need to change the tone of something, whether you need an EQ or a multiband compressor. And with the multiband compressors, a little bit goes a long way. So we'll certainly be revisiting the multiband compressor when we go over to mastering, but this should be enough information to at least get you started with using multiband compression in a DAW setting and start to get your gears turning on some of the different ways that you can use it. Okay, so the final compression type that we're going to be looking at in this video is going to be upward compression. And out of this group, upward compression is probably the one that you'll end up using the least, but really it's so far out there that it's definitely worth the mention because there are some very specific uses for it. Now, up until this point, every compressor and limiter that we've looked at is known as a downward compressor. So it basically takes loud sounds and reduces the volume or makes them lower. So upward compressors basically take soft sounds and make them louder. So it's kind of like a compressor wired in reverse. Now, I'm not aware of any hardware units that do upward compression, but they're probably out there somewhere. And there's really only a few software plugins that I'm aware of off the top of my head that actually offer that feature. And that's going to be the Waves C1 plugin the Melda Production M Dynamics plugin, and your Isotope compression plugins, both the ones included in Ozone and also Alloy. Now, we're actually lucky enough to have an example of both the Melda Production M Dynamics plugin and also the Isotope Alloy. So what's really the use in making soft sounds louder instead of making loud sounds softer? Well, when you think about our audio signal, the transient is actually the loudest part of our audio signal and also the part of the audio signal that our compressor is affecting. In the case that we still need to reduce dynamic range without affecting the transient, that's when we'll use an upward compressor. The downsides to upward compression is it's typically very noisy, and you usually need a lot of finesse to get them to sound right. 
Because if you think about it, compression is something that naturally happens in acoustics, but this idea of backwards or upwards compression really isn't. It can sound very unnatural if you don't apply it the right way. So you really need to watch the volume on your speakers when you're going to be experimenting with upward compression. So here's our Isotope Alloy Compressor here, and this compressor actually gives us some really great visuals as to how it's compressing a signal. I have this inserted onto our snare drum top mic right now. First, let's take a look at what happens when we use typical downward compression. So we'll start playback here, and we're gonna bring up our ratio, and we'll start bringing down our threshold. Now you can start seeing in this graph where it's actually ducking the audio signal every time there's a transient. It's lowering the volume, and this is where we get the term downward compression. Okay, so now let's take a look at upward compression. Now just to prevent any accidents from happening, we're gonna reduce our volume quite a bit here, because this can get pretty noisy. Then we'll reset our ratio back to one to one. Now the compressors that are actually capable of doing upward compression, you'll notice actually have ratios that can go under one. Now if you remember the graph that we were using when we were taking a look at the knee of the compressor, you can see how much different this looks in terms of input and output gain. When we start bringing down our threshold, you can see that inverted knee shape that we have now. So instead of reducing the volume of everything that goes above the threshold, it's actually going to increase the volume for anything that's below our threshold. Let's check it out. So we're gonna bring down our threshold. You can already see the difference in the graph there. And here we have a very natural transient, an explosive decay. And there go our peak meters there. And really the trick with upward compression is just to bring the threshold down just below that sharp transient. Okay, so you could see that we brought down our volume really low, but we were still clipping. So this is something that you really wanna go easy on and try to use a little bit of finesse when adjusting the settings, because you could really blow out your ears or kill your speakers if you're not careful. And really the trick to using the upward compressors is really to not have that much gain change at all. That's the way you get it to sound most natural. One thing I like about the Melder Production M Dynamics plugin is that when we move our ratio, we don't get such an extreme range of values as we do with the Isotope Alloy plugin. So this plugin kind of forces you into maintaining more natural values, but it also has built-in gain compensation to prevent you from blowing out your speakers. So really upward compressors are for when you need to reduce the dynamic range, but still keep your transient intact. And you won't use them often. Sometimes they sound good in voiceover, and sometimes they work really well as a special effect on drums but you could try some mild values on a bass guitar to really thicken it up. And you could even apply subtle upward compression during mastering and just try following it up with something like a limiter. But really with these, they really take some experimentation to get the right settings. So this will give you some food for thought next time you have a rainy day and wanna sit down and start experimenting with new sound processing techniques. In the next video, we're gonna to start to take a more subjective look at compression and start to pick apart some of the ways that we can use compressors both as a tool and as an effect. So until next time, guys, we'll see you then.